You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. If you have your Bible, uh, meet me in James chapter 5. Have you ever been rescued before? I don't mean just uh, someone in the nick of time came and gave you some change. I mean your literal life was in danger and someone saved it. If that's ever happened to you, then you know the feeling of thanksgiving and joy when someone has done that. I was a very, very, very young child, and someone in our church, this is years ago when we were in Marin, we went to their house to swim, and I'm standing on one of the steps, and in my mind, this whole pool is probably the same depth, and I step off of the stair into the water, and I go straight down, and I cannot swim at this time, so I am drowning. I remember to this day what it sounded like and what it looked like. To this day, I could still see it in my mind's eye. And then two strong hands lifted me up and put me on the side. And they said, I, as I came out the water, I looked over and I said, ooh, there's a hole down there. <laughs> That song, he picked me up, turned me around, placed my feet on solid ground. That was my testimony that day, (laughs) that I was rescued. And it felt amazing because if he hadn't picked me up, I would have died. Now, I want you to imagine this same person. You're sitting there on the side and you're watching and same thing happens. I step off into the pool and I'm drowning and the person is standing there and they don't do anything. They just watch me. What would you think about that person? You know that's evil. That's wrong. If it is in your ability to save someone, then you should do it. James today is going to teach us that we have a responsibility to rescue people who are in danger of death. So look again with me at James chapter 5, two verses today. We're finishing, we've been teaching through James. I started this book in July of last year, so we'll finish it today. Two verses at the end of this great epistle. Verse 19, James says, listen to the words of the Holy Spirit. In true living God. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from error, from the error of their way, will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. I want to just label this last message, Rescue Mission. I want to answer four questions about this text that I hope will help us as we go into the rest of this year thinking about our responsibility of rescuing people who are dying. And the the four questions I want to try to answer are, number one, who is the one wandering? Number two, what is wandering? Number three, what are they wandering from? And then lastly, what is our responsibility? So let's look at those, and then we'll go to lunch. Number one, who is the one wandering? Look again at verse 19. My brothers and sisters, this is one word in Greek. It's normally translated by other more literal translations as brothers, but it means all of us in the family of faith, brothers, sisters, men, women, But notice what he says, brothers and sisters, if one of you, who is the one of you? He is talking to 
a church full of committed followers of Jesus. And he says, if one of you were to wander, which sounds weird, why would someone who says they are a committed follower of Jesus wander from him? Now, a reason I want to start there is because this text has many different interpretations, and one of them being that the person who is wandering is someone who is not a Christian. But I want you to see that the person who is being spoken about here, at least at face value, is someone who is in the congregation. They are someone who at least professes with their mouth that they are Christians. Now, that doesn't mean that they are. We'll talk about that in a moment. But this is not someone from the outside. This is someone who is sitting in the pews and they are listening as James writes this letter and it's addressed to them. So who is the one who's wandering? Someone from among the church there. Here's the second question we're going to answer. What is wandering? We didn't sing it this morning. One of my favorite hymns has a line that says, Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let your goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. That is one of my favorite lines in hymns because every time I sing that, I always say, that's me. How prone my heart is to wander. And the the hymn writer says, from the God that I love. It's not the God that I hate. It's not the God that gets on my nerves. It's the God that I love that I'm so prone to wander from. But when he says here that if one of you should wander from the truth, what does he mean? The the word here for wander is where we get our word for planet. If you look up in the sky and you see the planets, they seem to sort of wander throughout the night sky. The picture is someone or something that is gone off the path, gone astray. To wander, it means to be deceived as well. And so there are at least three ways I see that we wander. How do we wander? How do we get astray? How can we sort of kind of go our own direction and get off of the path that we're supposed to be on? The first is there is unintentional wandering. Unintentional wandering. Jesus says, what if you are a shepherd and you have sheep, and one of them, he says, he uses this word, wanders away. Now, how do sheep wander away? Sometimes what they're doing, they're just eating and having a good time. And then they look up and they go, "Uh uh-oh, how'd I get here? They weren't trying to. They were just having a good time. Or sometimes they are very curious about what's going on in their surroundings, and they go after those things. It's unintentional. We one time, took, I took my kids to go to Disney on ice. We had an extra ticket. And so we said, let's bring Anaya. And so I went to go uh, um, pick him up. And when we got there, Aaron said, hey, I need you to keep an eye on him because he's a wanderer. He'll put his eyes up. He'll start looking here. And before you know it, you'll look down and he'll be gone. And I said, this is exactly the kind of wandering that is the first sense is I don't think he's actively trying to run. He's just enjoying his surroundings. He looks up and he's lost. This is someone who is wandering away from God, but they're doing it unintentionally. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 25 says, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. So there's unintentional wandering. But secondly, There is intentional wandering. This is someone who is actually looking to wander from the Lord. Listen to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. It says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, here it is, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There are some kids who are always looking for the chance to run away from their parents. In the theme parks, you've seen these kids? 
They're just always trying to scram. They're always trying to get away. This is the picture of someone who there is something that you want. There's something that you are pursuing more than you want God. Jesus said you can't love, you can't serve God and money. You will either love one or hate the other. So someone who is pursuing after something more than they pursue God is said to be someone who could be wandering away in this way. Now, when we think about wandering and it being intentional, one of the things that I remember is one particular individual that we knew who was a, a friend and someone who had walked with the Lord, done ministry with them. And at one point, we started to notice things about their life and their behavior that seemed a little off. And so they started to say things like, hey, you know, I think we want to do some ministry together. Let's do some podcasts and some music and concerts and write some books and all these different ministry ideas. But then they said, because we want to get this money. And we said, now, if you get money as a result of doing ministry, great. But the point or the focus or the goal of ministry is not to get money. And this person is no longer walking with the Lord. And we started to see this years ago. A a desire for money, a desire for things that are in contrast to God. The, the, The person who wants money or wants fame or wants riches more than they want God is a person who says they are intentionally walking away, wandering away. Here's the third way you can wander, not just unintentionally or intentionally, but if you are influenced, if you're influenced, sometimes the, re- in fact, the, the way that the, the, the Greek word is the, it is the subject is being acted on by something outside of it. And so this is someone where someone has influenced them in some way to walk away, to wander away. So you see this in the scriptures when it speaks about people who have walked away. 2 Peter 2, verse 15 says, They have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Bezer, who loved the wages of wickedness. There's money again. In Revelation chapter 20, in uh, chapter 2, verse 20, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, by her teaching, she misleads. That's that word, again, for wander. It causes them to go astray. My servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrifice to idols. Jesus warned people to not be deceived because there are people who through their teaching will try and influence you to walk away from God. This is one of the reasons we tell you, you can't just listen to anybody. Sometimes people say, ooh, listen to this great teacher. And I say, ah, I don't, that person is not a good person to listen to. Why? They got this and they got that. Because they are going to influence you to wander from what you know you're supposed to be attached to. And these people, they are, they are, they are, so bent on trying to get us to get away from God instead of stay near to him. So people who are influenced are people who have allowed themselves to be, de- uh, to be deceived. You need to be careful about who you let speak into your life. You need to be careful about the podcast you listen to. You need to be careful because you say, well, I'm a strong Christian. I've seen very, very strong Christians come to believe stupid things. Because they think, oh, I, I'm, I'm smart. I know. But Satan, he knows a lot. And he can deceive us. And so what happens is we can wander from the Lord in these various ways. We can do it unintentionally, intentionally, or due to influence. Now, the third question is, what are they wandering from? We know who is the wanderer. We have said, uh, what does it mean to wander? But Thirdly, what are they wandering from? Look again, verse 19. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the what? Truth. The truth. These who are among us 
have wandered from the truth. What is the truth? This particular word is used 109 times in the New Testament. Very, very, very common word. And the word just simply means that which corresponds to reality. That which really is. The word truth, in fact, what you, when you break it down, the actual word, it's something that is no longer hidden. Imagine something that is covered, and now that thing, it, the cover is taking off of it, and now you see it for what it really is, the reality, the state, the true state of affairs. The way I thought about it is, remember, you used to watch Scooby-Doo, and at the end, when they caught the person who was committing all the crimes, they say, now let's see who you really are. And they rip the mask off of them. It would reveal the truth, who they really are. Are And truth, when we talk about truth in the scriptures, it is about what is really reality. So one of the frameworks that I use all the time, especially when I talk to non-Christians, is I like to talk about your worldview. What is your worldview? And that's just what it is. How do you view the world? Because the, your worldview, it is how you interpret things, it's how you see reality. It's the lens that you look through that colors how you see all of life. So when we talk about worldview, one of the questions we have to ask is, how do I view the world that's around me? Because the way I view the world that's around me, that's how I determine what is true. Let's say you come home, it's a long day, you come into your house, and you're walking through the hallway, and as you're walking in the hallway, out comes your cell phone and begins to float right in the middle of the hallway. And goes back and forth and back and forth. And I ask you, what's happening? <laughs> now, dependent on your worldview, that will determine what you believe. Now, some people would see that, that will say, say, ah, it's a demon. And they would start to rebuke it. I rebuke you, demon of Android or <laughs> Apple or whatever you have. Or someone will see that and say, oh, it's my grandmother who's come to try and tell me something. Or it's a ghost who has unfinished business. Or it's a prank. Someone has string and they're lifting it up. Or you have a brain tumor. And you're looking at that and it's pushing on your doula blangada, whatever they call it. <laughs> And causing you to see an iPhone. <laughs> an iPhone. Whatever the reason is, your interpretation about what you're seeing is going to be based on your worldview. Because some people say, there's no such thing as demons. No such thing as ghosts. So this has to be natural. Other people say, oh, no, I believe in a world that has spiritual realities. And so that's probably a demon. All of us have a way that we see the world. So how do you come to determine what your worldview is, or what are some questions that we can ask in determining our worldview? Here's four that I think will help you. Number one, the question of origin. The question of origin. This is the question of where do we come from? How did we come to be? How did the universe and the earth and human beings, how did we get here? The question of origin. Number two, the question of meaning. Okay, we're here, but is there any meaning? Is there any purpose? If we are just an accident, then how can you say we have purpose? A lot of people say, oh, we have a purpose, we have meaning, but yeah, but you already said we we're an accident. That it was just a bang that came out of nothing, and now all of a sudden there's, there's purpose. Their worldview doesn't really match. Meaning, the question of meaning. Number three, the question of morality. How do you know what's good? How do you know what's evil? How do you know what's right? How do you know what's wrong? Is truth subjective, that you determine it, or is truth objective, something that's outside of you? How do we determine what is right? Because we're living in a culture now where you know they're flip-flopping on what they think right is wrong. Yeah. And fourth, the question of destiny. Where is this all heading? 
Is there heaven? Is there hell? Is there an afterlife? Do we come back as something? Some of us come back as trees. Some of us come back as cell phones. Do we come back? What, what is the end of the destiny of the world, the destiny of human beings? Now, all those questions, Christianity has an answer to, don't, doesn't it? Amen. All of those questions, we can say we can answer the question of origin. We can answer the question of meaning. We can answer the question of morality. We can answer the question of destiny. And that is our worldview. Notice what the person is walking away from is truth. They're walking away from the very thing that help us to see the way things really are. And here's the question. How do Christians know what the world really is? How do we know what reality is? James tells us in this book, because he uses this word earlier in the, in the uh, epistle, in James chapter uh, 1, verse 18, it says, He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. The way we know what is truth is we have the word of God. Amen. Jesus said it even more directly. John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth, your word is truth. So what are people wandering from? They're wandering from the truth. They're wandering from the pillars that help us to know the way the world really is. And what you see, people don't walk away because, oh, you have a doctrine that I disagree with. Usually the, the, when people are walking away from truth, there's something that they don't like about the way that we view the world. For example, I know, remember one person who used to be a part of our church, we started to notice that they were having doubts and they started to say, oh, I don't know, I'm starting to wonder if this is right because of this and because of this. And the reality was there was somebody in their family who was pretty close to passing away. They were sick. And they said, I can't believe that God would allow this person to go to hell. That doesn't seem right to me. And so they began to question, is this true? And before you know it, that questioning turned into them walking away. They began to say, I can't trust what's in this book anymore. They walk away not from church. Church might be a part of it. They didn't walk away from prayer, Bible study. They're walking away from reality, the way the world really is. They're walking away from the truth of the gospel. And their worldview has begun to change. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. Notice, the loving of the truth is the very thing that saves your life. Amen. If you deny or hate or reject the truth, you cannot be saved Amen. because it is the truth. It is reality. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So we need to make sure we're not letting, say, well, that person just walked away from church or my church. That's, that's symptomatic, and it probably is tied to walking away from truth. But we need to be careful that we don't just make it about walking away from a building. You, their, your lifestyle and your, the way you think and your theology and your lifestyle is now so far from what it should be if you were walking with God. Here's the fourth question. So then, what is our responsibility? Look at it again. Verse 19. If one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back. Remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. What is our responsibility? Now, I want you to notice something. There's no word in here that says pastor or elder or deacon or professional Christian. It says, if someone. Amen. That means if you're here, you're a follower of Christ, you are someone. Amen. The command here to rescue the wanderer is given to every Christian. Amen. And this is important to hear because 
a lot of times what people want to do is give this responsibility to the professionals. They call pastor, I, I saw somebody doing something they was supposed, was supposed to be doing, and I just want to tell you. Why didn't you say something? Amen. Well, you know, that's your job. <laughs> no, it's your job. Yeah. If you see it, to do something. Someone that you see who is wandering, go after them. So what does this mean? This means that when we as believers come together in the various ways, we cannot afford to be aloof. That when we come into this room, we cannot be detached emotionally. We cannot be detached and distant and reserved from others because we need to have our spiritual antenna up. And is there anyone among us who is wandering? We can't attend church, cell group, prayer, and just ignore the signs of someone who is wandering. Because surfacey Christianity or surfacey church life is not biblical. Amen. We should be able to discern, have our eyes open to those among us who are wandering from the truth. There's a movie called What Women Want. Mel Gibson is struck by lightning and develops the ability to hear what women think. And so he uses it to his advantage in many ways, but he is in his office one day and there's a girl, her name is Erin, and they call her Erin the file girl. Because all she does is just carry files to people and so she's, you know, just have an important, well, it's an important job, but not to everybody else. And sometimes she will drop her files on the floor and people will walk over her, not, not helping her. And she begins to think in her mind, man, nobody cares about me. If I just didn't show up, then they would say, <laughs> man, where's that Aaron girl who carries files around? I mean, she's in her mind. No one cares about her. She's living her life and literally everybody in the office doesn't pay her any attention or any mind. In fact, later in the movie, she doesn't show up, and he begins to think, oh, no, she's done something to herself. But it's been months, if not years, of her just walking into her office and people just ignoring her, not, not caring about her at all. That cannot be the church. It cannot be that people can be in the midst of the body of Christ, be hurting, be wandering, and nobody says anything. Nobody does anything. This we cannot afford to be aloof. The church, it must never be like that. Because look at what is at stake. He says, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death. That is amazing. You actually save this person from death. Proverbs 10 and verse 12 is Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Amen. And in 1 Peter 4, 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. You save this person from death. You cover over a multitude of sins because of your love for them. He's saying the the. The job you have in rescuing the wanderer is so important that you are literally saving this person from death. Now, when you hear that, it's a crazy thought. Let me put it this way, that there are people in heaven who might be able to walk up to you and say, I'm here because of you. If you had not come after me, I would have ended up in death. Now, what this brings up is this is not a, ins a small insignificant task because some people are actually, the wanderer is in actual danger. They're in actual danger. Some of you, you take meds and the meds have different side effects. But if one of the side effects of the medicine that you're taking is death, would you take it? Well, if you take this, you might die. That seems like a very, very... Now, I know a lot of these medicines have so many side effects. They, that, the side effects will probably kill you anyway. But the, you would never take a medicine 
knowing that one of the side effects is death. We think wandering, oh, they're just doing a little bit of wandering, not realizing they're actually flirting with death. They're flirting with death. Now, what this brings up is, well, then what kind of death? Now, again, let me just say this again, because I want you to hear what I'm saying. We went to the beach a few weeks ago, and, you know, you know me, I don't like the water, I don't like the beach, I don't like all of that. But my kids love the ocean. So one thing we told them was, you need to be careful because if you go out too far, you can be pulled in and under. A lot of people have gone to the beach and doing various things, and because they don't know the power of the ocean, that it could actually suck them in and drown them. So we told them, hey, you guys are out there playing, and we had, there was multiple kids there. And so the further out they got, then we said, hey, hey, come back. You're wandering out a little bit too far. You're actually in danger. I know you're having fun, but there's actual danger. You can be pulled in and under, and so you need to pay attention. So we, we called them. We said, hey, come back, step back, and I think what James would say is that the tide is coming in, and if these wanderers are not careful, they can be taken under. Not everyone who is sitting in the chairs of the church is a believer. And so what this brings up a question is, is the, and I asked this before, is the wanderer an unbeliever or a believer? Is this person who wanders from us a believer or a believer? And the reason that this comes up is because it says that you rescue them from death. Now, follow me. If it rescues this person who's wandering from death, if they are a Christian, then what kind of death is it saving them from? This has led people, some people to say, well, the person who wanders is a believer, but the death that you save them from is actually physical death. And what they'll say is sometimes what God will do is he will actually take the life of a believer to keep them from sinning further. Remember Ananias and Sapphira who were lying about the amount that they gave, that they, and what happened? They lied and the Lord took their lives right then and there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 30, remember it says, do not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Because some of you have fallen asleep. So for some people, if it's, a, if, a, if it's a believer, then perhaps the Lord takes their life in order to keep them from sinning. But if it's an unbeliever that's wandering, what death are they being saved from? There's two kinds of death in the Bible. There is physical death, which is a separation of your soul, your spirit from your body. But then there is uh, spiritual death, which the book of Revelation says is being thrown into the lake of fire, because that's the second death. So the unbeliever, they would say, is being saved from the second death. So which one is it? Is the person who is wandering a believer and they're being saved from physical death, or are they an unbeliever and they're being saved from spiritual death? Now, here's the answer that I would give. It doesn't really matter. In fact, this, this question brings up all kinds of different questions. Another one being, um, did the wanderer lose their salvation? Have you ever heard this doctrine of that you can be saved and then you can, through your actions or, or whatever, you're, you're wandering, that you can actually lose your salvation? That's one idea that this person who's wandering has lost their salvation, or the other is that this person was never really a believer at all. In fact, John says they went out from us because they were never really of us. So the question that comes up is this wanderer, were they someone who lost their salvation or were they someone who was never a believer at all? And again, I would say the answer to the question, and we can have debates about that. I love debates about eternal security, but I don't think it matters either way because it says the responsibility doesn't change. If the person loses their salvation, you should still go after them. If the person is, was never a believer, you should go after them. Your responsibility doesn't change. You have the same responsibility to go after the wanderer. Now, I don't believe that someone who is truly saved can lose 
the gift of salvation. And I think the Bible is very, very clear about that. But I, 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 I'm hammering on this because I want you to see just how important you are to what God is doing. Because if it's true that you saved the person from death, the thought I had, and maybe the question that you have, is I thought God was the one who saved from death. I thought God was the one who covered sin. And it seems like James here is putting us in the place of God. And there's no doubt that God is the one who saves and that God is the one who redeems and that God is the one who covers sin. But here's what I want you to hear this morning. Your salvation, what Scripture says is that if you have received Christ, the work that God has begun, he's going to bring it to completion. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 8, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jude 1 and verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. Who is the one who keeps us? Who is the one who causes us to have eternal security? Now, here's the answer I'm going to give you. Eternal security is a community project. Eternal security is a community project because it is accomplished through community. How does God preserve his people? How does God keep his people? The answer is partly through his people, through the community. Eternal security is certain for God's chosen people, for his elect. It is certain. But you say, well, then how do we play a part in this? Because it sounds like I'm the one who goes out and I bring this person back from death and cover over sin. How does God come into this? And the answer is, Think about it. If you catch a fish, who is responsible for catching the fish? Or what was the cause of you catching the fish? Well, was it the hook? Was it the bait? Was it the line? Was it the pole? Was it the current that brought the fish to you? Was it the boss who told the man, hey, take the weekend off and go fishing? And the answer is, it was all of them working together to catch the fish. And so eternal security says that God is the one who ultimately saves, but God uses means. He uses instruments. Could God do it himself? Yes. How, does pe how do people get saved? Through the preaching of the gospel. But how did God save Abraham? Remember Abraham? Who preached to him? No one. God came to him. Who preached to Paul? Jesus came and knocked him off his horse. So it's true, God, he doesn't need us. He doesn't need you. He, doesn't mean, he can do whatever he wants. But what is the way that God normally does it? He uses the preaching of his gospel. He uses you. He uses me to go out and to bring those who are wandering in. So we're working together with God. He uses instruments. This morning I was listening to a preacher. He's preaching on the feeding of the 5,000. And he's, he's, he's talking about it. And there's this point that he made. I thought, oh, that's so, so true. That it is God who multiplied the fish and loaves. But it was the boy who provided the lunch. It was the disciples who went out and passed it around. In other words, Jesus, he could have just said, I mean, let me make bread and fish come out of nowhere. Let me rain it from heaven. He's done that. But instead, he says, I'm going to use human instruments and work through those to be able to bring this miracle to pass. And so it's, 
It's never been, it's never been purely just the Lord doing it. He's always worked through means to accomplish his goals. You've never come into church and seen Jesus standing up here. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to church. Jesus uses men and women who are submitted to him to bring people back. Amen. You guys heard of TULIP, the acronym TULIP that speaks about how God saves total depravity and unconditional election and irresistible grace and limited atonement. But the last one, P, is perseverance of the saints. The idea that all that God saves, all who God brings to himself, he will cause them to persevere and go to the end. And I love that doctrine, but one of the words I've been using in, in replace of it sometimes is because when you hear persevere, you think it's me. I have to be the one that goes and have to be the one that walks through this. And I have to be the one that pulls myself up by my own bootstraps. So I like to say not just the perseverance of the saints, but the preservation of the saints, that God is the one who will preserve us. It is not so much that you are holding on to God, it is that God is holding on to you. If you want to know what is the cause of me never walk, it is, it says no one will be able to snatch them out of my hand. You are protected. But, as we've said, do you have to work out your salvation? Yes. God works in us? Yes. But I think we can be so worried about knowing who's saved and who isn't. That's one of the questions Christians like to ask. Are they saved? Is so-and-so a Christian? This particular singer or this particular actor or this person who came in, and I'm not saying that's not an appropriate question to ask sometimes, and just times you need to determine those things. But ultimately, here's, here's how I would say we should think about this, because it, I think it will help you. Here's what it is. The final proof of genuine salvation is shown not in mere profession of faith, but perseverance of faith. Amen. In other words, there are people, I don't care... I don't care who you are, you won't know who they are until the end. This very church has had people, ministers, deacons, worship leaders, ushers, who are no longer walking with God. And if you would ask me during that time, do they walk with God, I would have said yes, absolutely. But we do not know. Because eternal security is a group project. Discipleship is also a group project. What is discipleship? I love Mark Dever's definition. He says that discipling is, quote, helping someone follow Jesus by doing deliberate spiritual good in his or her life. Doing deliberate spiritual good in his or or her life. So how do we do it? We've asked, we said this is our responsibility, but how exactly are we supposed to do this? What are, what are we supposed to do? Let me give you two things to do. First thing, if you see or perceive someone is wandering from the faith, number one, you need to contact them. Contact them. I already hear, I'm not that kind of person. I'm an introvert. I don't like confrontation. You have to contact them. Now, you don't have to do it the same way. You can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. You can send a text. You can send an email. If you don't like any of that stuff, you can send a letter. But you need to contact them. And when you contact them, you need to encourage them. You need to listen to them. You need to maybe even confront them and rebuke them. But anyone that you see who's wandering from the truth, you need to actually contact them. Because it is your responsibility given to you by God 
to bring them back. Here's the second thing. Pray for them. Now, all the people who are introverts say, I can do that. That's the one I like, pray. But I don't want us to throw that away as if, oh, you know, the more important thing is to contact them. Because this week when I saw this in Luke, it was really encouraging to me. Luke chapter 22 and verse 32. Jesus says to Peter that Satan asked to sift you like wheat. And this was his response. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. What a prayer. I have prayed that your faith would not fail. What does Satan want? He wants your faith to fail. And Jesus prays that your faith will not fail. Remember, Peter, he denied him three times, and he went back to fishing. He's like, this whole Jesus season of my life is over. He's back in the boat, and Jesus comes to him. His faith did not fail. And so here's the question. Do you pray for those you've seen who have wandered away? I was asked this question this week, and it really bothered me. I'm going to ask you this question. If tonight God answered in one fell swoop all the prayers you prayed last week, how many new people would be in the kingdom tomorrow? How many new people would be in the kingdom tomorrow? Is your prayer life kingdom focused or you focused? And I said, after I heard that question and the answer that I had, it's not that you don't pray for others. It's not that you don't pray for people to be saved. But there can be weeks where you don't pray at all for the salvation of your friends and family. I said, Lord, I never want anybody to ask me that question. And I don't have an answer that says hundreds. I want, Lord, you to bring people in to the faith. There's a hymn called Rescue the Perishing. And it's written by Fanny J. Crosby. Probably the only person you probably hear singing it would be my dad. But it's it's a hymn that popped into my mind this week. And so I looked up the history of it, and Fanny J. Cross, she's written many hymns that we sing. She was a prolific hymn writer. But the the original um, story of this hymn is that she was visiting a mission, and while she was there at the mission, there was a guy there who, I guess, had grown up in a Christian home, and he was concerned that he was never going to see his mother again because she had died, she went to heaven, and he said, he told uh, Fanny, he said, I feel like I have, I've wandered away from <clears throat> my mother's God and I must be rescued. So she prayed for him and led him to Christ. And then he said, now I am ready to meet my mother in heaven for I have found God. And so she wrote this, this hymn in response to um, this situation that happened at this mission. I just want to read it to you. This is the hymn. It says, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep over the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Verse 2 says, though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive, plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently, he will forgive if they only believe. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings like burden that grace can restore, touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, cords that were broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing. Duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell them, tell the poor wanderer, A Savior has died. I always thought that that song was about go out to people who are outside of the faith, who've never heard of Jesus, that kind of thing. But this was actually a song she wrote for someone who had grown up around the things of God. And I think we think a lot about winning the lost. Amen. 
But I also think we need to about win, think about winning the saved. That there are those around us, so yeah, they're not literally saved, but they've been part of us. And is there anybody that you know that used to be here, used to be a part of us, who's not, no longer here, that you can call them, you can text them, hey, what happened? What happened? You're in danger. I want to call you back. There's two ways you can listen to this sermon. You can listen to this sermon and say, I'll never wander from God. And so I'll always be the one doing the rescuing. Or you can hear it humbly, believing that one day you might need someone to come after you. And that you'll commit yourself to doing that for someone else. Here's the danger of a sermon like this. I'm going to, I'm, I need to be, make sure I'm ready to rescue people. In humility, this past few months, the Lord has shown me just how far I am from where I think I am. You ever have something happen and you say, I didn't know that was still in me. I didn't think I could, th- I didn't know I thought like that. I didn't know I could plan something like that. You're, you think you're further along than you are. You think you're holier than you really are. It is, it is foolish to not believe. It is foolish to believe that I'm, I'm everything that I need and I don't need, I don't need any help. <laughs> I'm already where I need to be. No, you are not. And you need your friends, your family, the people of God to come around you. If you were to fall away, if you were to fall away from the faith, how would you answer this question? If I were to fall away from the faith, it would probably be because of blank. How would you answer that question? If I were to fall away from the faith, I would never fall away. But if you were to fall away from the faith, what would it be because of, it would probably be because of that. How would you answer that question? However you answer that question, it's something that you need to pay attention to. Because that's the very thing that the devil will use to try and draw you away. It's an odd way to end the book, right? You got to rescue people. And then you just, that's it, the book ends. No pray for me, no the grace of God be with you. It just ends. And I don't think it's because James doesn't know what he's doing. I think because the entire book has been this. The entire book has been written saying, are you really a Christian? We've said that the title of this this series is Faith in Motion. James' whole reason for writing this epistle is to say, I want you to look at your life. When I was in youth group, one of the questions that we were always asked is, if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And would the jury come back and say, we find the defendant innocent of being a Christian? And what this book does is it says, look at your life and determine, is my life, am I living out the faith? James has been saying to the readers from the beginning, you need to do. The Christian faith is not just about what you believe, it's about what you do. But he ends by saying it's not just about what you do, it is also looking to your brothers and sisters and making sure that they do also. What do I do? What are you doing? And if I notice, if I see that you're wandering, you're in danger, and in me coming to you, And pulling you back could save you. And the Lord will forgive your sins and cover. So we're in this together. We're following together. We're worshiping together. Let's cross the finish line together. Let's pray. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.